I want to introduce to you Alan Morgan. Uh, Alan is the CEO of the National Rural Health Association. He joined the association in 2001. He has more than 20 years experience in health policy development at the state and federal level. He previously worked for U.S. Congressman Dick Nichols and former Kansas Governor Mike Hayden. Mr. Morgan's experience also includes 10 years with the American Society of Clinical Pathologists and Heart Rhythm Society, where he established a D.C.-based government affairs office, and prior to joining the National Rural Health Association, he served as a federal lobbyist. Mr. Morgan's health policy articles have been published in the Journal of Rural Health, the Journal of Cardiovascular Management, the Journal of Pacing and Clinical Electrophysiology, did I say that right? And, and uh, Laboratory Medicine. He's also served as a co-author for the sixth edition of Policy and Politics in Nursing and Health Care. Mr. Morgan earned a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Kansas and a master's degree in public administration from George Mason University. In 2011, he was selected by readers of Modern Healthcare as being among the top 100 most influential people in healthcare. So please help me welcome Mr. Morgan. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Back in the room, right, right? All right, I'm with the National Rural Health Association. Our tagline is, your voice, louder. So I just want to make sure that I'm on par with what our marketing department wants to talk about. Hey, I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here in our nation's capital with a room full of rural advocates who are not my members. You may not realize this, but rural is not always the key topic in our nation's capital, right? And if we are not the key topic in our nation's capital, rural gets forgotten, and then you have the potential of having crazy things happen in a presidential election, am I right? Well, let's talk about rural, let's talk about rural health. Um, you've had two amazing speakers, and Representative Ellison and Secretary Vilsack, so I kind of want to take what they talked about from a policy perspective, from a political perspective and a healthcare perspective and, and bring them to somewhat of a close right now, specifically focusing on rural, all right? Now, it, I find it funny, ironic, I'm from a small town in Kansas. When I talk with people that are from rural, no one ever asks me, how do you define rural, right? We, we know rural, but when you're in your nation's capital, that's one of the first things they always want to know, how do you define rule? So let's, let's begin with just a little bit of audience participation. How many ways does the federal government use to define rural? A thousand? It's a big, it's a big uh, bureaucracy, right? Any other guesses? 17, that is close. According to Dr. Gary Hart of the University of North Dakota, the federal government uses 72 ways of defining rural across all their programs. So actually, it's closer to 1,000. Um, I have to be honest with you. When I talk with Gary Hart, who is a nationally known expert in definitions for rural, he said, eh, Alan, I stopped counting at 72. Um, th for us at the Rural Health Association, we don't support definitions. We believe you should focus on designations, right? Because each rural community is unique and each federal program needs to adequately represent the population it's serving. But if we are forced to define rural, here is our definition at our organization. Rural America is a place where those most in need of healthcare services have the fewest options available to seek that care, right? You, you have a situation with those uh, in rural America of high health disparities, heart, cardiovascular disease, obesity, hypertension, um, diabetes, you can go on and on and on, with a workforce shortage, shortage of clinicians. This setup that we see in rural America create situations like what we see in the opioid crisis, which is impacting rural America. 
So I'm going to focus my discussions a little bit on, on the opioid crisis, um, what this means for rural going ahead. Not surprisingly, at the Rural Health Association, the, the challenges of addressing drug abuse and drug addiction issues have long been at the forefront of our organization. In fact, we have a 10-page policy paper on the issue. Let me pause right there and, and tell you this, rural health. At the end of my presentation, that's all you need to remember. Rural health, go on Google, Yahoo, Bing, type in the words rural health. Our website is always the first thing that pops up. You can see all of our policy papers. It's a great resource for you personally as you're dealing with housing issues and you want to know what is the difference between urban and rural and where's the data. You can find this on our website. So I want, I want to start right there. Um, it's interesting to note, as we develop this 10-page paper on the opioid crisis, um, what was the real sticking point? What were the discussions that we had? I have to be honest with you, they were not on, on the treatment, the, the, the workforce component of it, because we have experts in that. That's us, that's our organization. We spent a tremendous amount of time without coming to resolution on the transportation and the housing issues, right? Because that's not our expertise. That is why groups like ours need to partner with you. That is the key policy question you have this week. Looking at it from that angle, what are the legislative and regulatory policy levers, and what are the best practices that we need to replicate which ensure that we have affordable, accessible, safe, drug-free housing op op opportunities for rural populations, right? That is what we need to know. From an organization standpoint, we, we, we largely punted on that issue, and we simply say in our paper, there needs to be collaborations on a community-wide basis to address housing and transportation needs. This is the opportunity that we have. I want you to realize that two months from now, our organization will have nearly 600 advocates in town again, just like you are this, this week, again up on Capitol Hill talking about the need and the relevance and the importance of rural health. It is so very important as we move forward that we collaborate, we coordinate, and we speak with a common voice on behalf of rural. On behalf of the 62 million Americans that live in rural America. Now, if you caught that, Secretary Vilsack only counted 50. I'm sticking with 62. Let me start with this. Um, I, 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 as you might imagine, attend a lot of rural conferences, and I find that sometimes we get wrapped around the axle talking about what we don't have, our, 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 our lacking in rural America. And we don't do the true service of talking what are our assets. So when I'm giving a presentation, I want to make sure that I talk about what's the strengths in rural and what are our shortcomings. Let me begin with the shortcomings. From World War II up until 1992, life expectancy within rural and urban both increased at the same level. Both increased at the same level. The funny part about that is before World War II, and I'm sure you all know this, life expectancy was actually higher in rural areas. Something happened in 1992, and since that time, as a nation, life expectancies have continued to increase, sometimes dramatically, in urban populations, while we've seen a decrease of life expectancy in rural. Now, Dr. Singh has published this data within the Journal of American uh, Medical Association. Also, Robert Wood Johnson community rankings uh, profiles have articulated this, this discrepancy as well, too. Why are rural Americans dying? There's a policy question. And it's a policy question without an easy answer. But I can tell you two key drivers in that and what is responsible as well, too. Key driver number one, suicide rates. You see the farther you go out from urbanized areas to rural, suicide rates increase. Two, the opioid crisis. The opioid crisis. 
Um, Secretary Vilsack indicated that this is a rural crisis. Uh, show of hands from West Virginia, Senator Manchin has been a key driver at the federal level on this issue as well too. Now, as I try to waffle back and forth between current and past, I, I end up, I, I have to weave them both together. I don't know if any of you watch Westworld, but it's kind of like one of those shows. Um, let me state this. Um, Secretary Vilsack has been the one after the presidential election that has said this election represents not, not, not an example of rural, white, racist, sexist individuals electing an inappropriate person, but what Secretary Vilsack has says, this represents a population that feels marginalized, forgotten, and wants their voice heard. He wasn't the first one that identified that. I have to tell you this, back in June, I attended the Clinton Global Initiative in Atlanta. President Clinton kicked off the Global Initiative talking about the op opioid crisis and how this crisis represents a loss of hope among rural populations. And he said at that time, if we don't address this issue, we're going to have problems. At the time, I was just delighted to hear the president kicking off this major uh, 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 conference talking about rural. Um, in retrospect, it was so foreshadowing of what we saw later on in that component. We can't let rural Americans fall behind when we talk about this. And what does this mean to the life expectancy component? I will say this also, when I talk about health disparities, you have workforce shortages, and in no part of our healthcare system is the rural-urban discrepancy as large as it is in behavioral health and access to mental health providers in rural America. So is it a surprise that we see dramatically higher suicide rates and drug addiction and drug overdoses in rural populations? No. But we can't just focus in on the health component. That's where we need you um, and your partnership as well as we go forward on this. It's key to it. Access is important, access to health care. Access in rural America is important. So where are we going as a nation? Um, well, since 2010, we've had 79 rural hospitals close across the US. That may not sound like a lot unless you look at the trend lines and project forward. Unless we do something to address the health care safety net, and unless we start focusing on rural communities, Within 10 years, we will see one quarter of the nation's rural hospitals close. Let that sink in for a second. That's roughly 700 communities without a hospital. 700 communities without a hospital. And in most rural communities, hospitals, the healthcare system, are the second largest employer behind the school system. It's just not an access issue, it's also an economic component as well too. How do we maintain the viability of rural America without these hospitals? Very, very important. I, I do want to say, I'm always looking, trying to look at the silver lining on this, and I will say this as a silver lining as we move forward. The current administration has seen this crisis brewing, and I will say they've been a little hesitant to address it front on because of the concern from the political nature that people are simply going to blame the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, for hospital closures, which isn't the case. It's also because of Medicare cuts, it's because of sequestration, it's because of bad debt cuts, it's because of the changing nature of our health care system going from inpatient volumes to outpatient volumes. So we haven't had the focus on this rural hospital closure crisis that we need. We are hopeful that this changes going ahead. Now, in the midst of this, the hospital closure crisis, the declining life expectancy in rural, the workforce shortages, whoo, is that enough bad stuff for us? Let's talk about what does work in rural right now. Number one, there is a push towards measuring quality in our healthcare system, which we all agree needs to happen. As we begin to, to actually measure quality in a healthcare setting, a funny thing is happening. 
The funny thing is happening is rural health care is as good and in many cases better than the urban outcomes. How about that? That's not what we expect, right? Because we know, we know the company line, well, rural is, is second tier. According to the outcomes, it's better in many cases. Not surprisingly, you're primarily talking about primary care, your clinicians, you go into the critical access hospital in your small community, they know you, they know your family, they know you were at McDonald's last night, they know all about you. They know your healthcare system. You're not lost once you go into there. They follow you. There's a coordination of care. And that plays out, which is good. Let me talk about another important thing. When we're talking and when you're talking on Capitol Hill, sometimes you get the, eh, what are you going to do? I hate that. Eh, what are you going to do? Rules declining. People are dying out. It's moving away. Eh, what are you going to do? Looking at the census numbers, looking at the census numbers, you see that since the Great Recession, population trend in rural America has actually leveled off and last year actually saw an uptick. Now, you could blame that on, well, this is just baby boomers, they're coming back, what it, you know, maybe this is a temporary thing. But I will also say that data coming from the National Education Association shows that for a first time ever, the population of students in rural schools is also on the incline. Now, this isn't baby boomers. These are young families that are now selecting the rural lifestyle and the quality of life and the community that you find in rural America. This is the future of rural America. So if you have a situation where the population is increasing, the school children are increasing as well, it is not something you can overlook. How's that for a, 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 does that seem to have, like Dick Clark would say, does that have a beat and you can dance to it? I think that's a pretty good message, right? And then we had the election. I'm like, oh, wow, now I have two good messages. What am I going to go with? Stick with me. I'm talking as fast as I can. Let's talk a little bit uh, uh, about um, the election and the rural vote going ahead and the opioid crisis. This week, and Secretary Vilsack referenced the legislation we have going through the House of Representatives, and hopefully it'll go through the Senate as well, too. Um, we're optimistic about that. But, but let's not forget what, what is the, the challenge and the opportunity about the opioid issue when it comes to rural populations. Um, any legislation that pumps a lot of money in, they want to show dramatic improvement. So where are you going to find dramatic improvements? You're going to find them in urban areas. That's where you're going to be able to show the most numbers of people saved. There's a real danger, again, as we rush to try to address this uh, crisis, to focus only in urban areas. There needs to be recognition that although there's more people there, the resources can be combined there to have greater outcomes on, on, a, on a data component. This is a rural crisis that we're facing, and you cannot ignore that issue. Let me go back to the Clinton Global Initiative. Right after President Clinton announced that this is a rural crisis, right after Senator Manchin announced that this is a rural issue, they broke out into a session, and we heard the great success story of Georgetown University Hospital and Baltimore Hospital without any discussion about rural success stories. The disconnect, you see this? This is a disconnect that we're facing. We have to, as, as um, uh, uh, Representative Ellison mentioned at the very beginning, we have to hold people accountable and we have to move beyond the rhetoric to actually delivering for us and what we need to do. Those are the next steps as we move forward for us, for us as a rural voice. Carrying those forward, how do we ensure that the housing component is included in this as we move forward? I mentioned represent, or, uh, both President Clinton acknowledge it, Secretary Vilsack acknowledge it, um, a great rural advocate by the name of D. Davis with Rural Strategies in Kentucky, I hope some of you have heard of him. He did an amazing analysis in Politico right after the election. And his analysis is this, um, sometimes in rural, and I mentioned I'm from a one-stop-light town myself, we 
we, we miss the policy component and it, we, we view it from a context. Are people talking down to us? Um, are people relating to us? Do people actually understand the challenges we face? I think going forward, making sure that we're able to communicate the unique environment which is rural is going to be key for us, all of us, to make sure that rural is not left behind as we go forward. I greatly appreciate our two national organizations working together as we move forward. We're going to be doing that at the national level, but it will mean nothing if you are not engaged at the community level across sector, not just with health, with transportation, with ag, with small business. Please reach out. I can't thank you enough for the opportunity today, and let me close with saying, go rural. <laughs>